neurons. And now we're going to get into how these neurons talk to one another, uh, starting with the synapse. The synapse shouldn't be entirely new to you because a synapse is a way that two nerves uh, talk to one another. But it's going to be very similar to the way in which a nerve talked to the muscle cell in the last chapter. Difference being we'll have two nerves here. And there are a few other differences that we'll get into and in how nerves are used to integrate the information as well as uh, just uh, pass on a signal to do something. So the nervous system works because information flows from neuron to neuron. And those junctions are connected by synapses. Uh, they can be from one neuron to another neuron, which we'll talk mostly about today, or one neuron to an effector cell, which we talked about when we talked about causing a muscle to contract. <clears throat> In this case, when we're talking about two, neur two neurons, we will have the first neuron, which we'll call the presynaptic neuron. It's sending signals to that synapse. And the postsynaptic neuron, which is receiving the signal at that synapse, the second one. Uh, in, the in the peripheral nervous system, that might be a neuron, might be a muscle cell as we've already seen, it might be a gland. Uh, most neurons are not just a presynaptic or a postsynaptic. Most neurons are presynaptic for one, at least one synapse and postsynaptic for other synapses. They're all coming together, uh, talking to the uh, target cell, the postsynaptic, this would be the postsynaptic neuron. These would be exosomatic synapses. This is an exodendrite synapse, and this would be an uh, exo, exoaxonal synapse because it's bound to the, this axon is connected directly to this axon. Uh, so these are three presynaptic neurons, and this would be the postsynaptic neuron for this group. Uh, here they are microscopically. So <clears throat> as you saw on that, you can have axodendritic between an axon terminal, one neuron, and dendrites of another axosomatic between an axon and the cell body of another. We can also get axonal, which are uh, less common, Dendro, dendrodendritic, that would be dendrite to dendrite, or dendrite to cell body, uh, somatodendritic. The types of synapses we can have fall into two classes, and that depends on how the information is passed across that synapse how the information gets from the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron. And those two types are chemical synapses, the most common by far, and electrical synapses that we'll touch on. So chemical synapses are the most common. They release a substance called a neurotransmitter. Uh, they're typically composed of two parts, an axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron which has synaptic vesicles that are filled with that neurotransmitter, a receptor region on the postsynaptic neuron's membrane that receives that neurotransmitter. Usually that's going to be on the dendrites of that neuron or on the cell body. And they are separated by a fluid-filled space that we call the synaptic cleft. Now again, this should sound very similar because it's pretty much what we had in a muscle cell. The difference here is that we have two neurons talking to each other. So the electrical impulse is changed to a chemical impulse across the synapse. So electrical signal will come down the presynaptic neuron. The presynaptic neuron will release neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter will bind to the postsynaptic neuron and that will be converted into a membrane uh, electrical event, either a graded potential or a uh, action potential. That transmission uh, from the synaptic cleft keeps impulses from directly passing from one nerve to the next. Uh, it is a chemical event as opposed to an electrical one. It's going to require the release, diffusion, and receptor binding of the neurotransmitters. This ensures unidire unidirectional communication between neurons, and it is also the rate-limiting step of this process. <clears throat> 
In order to get that information across the synapse, we have six different steps that are involved. And again, these are going to be very similar to what you saw in stimulating a muscle cell to contract. So an action potential, electrical event we talked about earlier, arrives at the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron. That changes the voltage of the membrane and the voltage-gated calcium channels, we didn't mention those when we talked about voltage-gated channels earlier, open and calcium from outside the neuron gets into the axon terminal. Calcium is going to flow down its electrical chemical gradient, so it's going to come in because it's got a plus charge and the inside of the cell is negative, and there's more calcium outside the cell than inside the cell. So our electrical signal action potential has come down the axon, come to the terminal, changes in voltage, open calcium channels, calcium floods into the uh, axon terminal. And that calcium entry causes the synaptic vesicles to uh, release their neurotransmitter. Their calcium acts on a synaptogammon protein that reacts with snare proteins that fuse with the uh, fuse the synaptic vesicle with the axon membrane, and that fusion results in exocytosis of the neurotransmitter. And the higher the impulse frequency, the more vesicles, exocytose, so you get a greater concentration of neurotransmitter in response to higher impulse frequencies. So calcium coming into the cell <clears throat> causes these vesicles that already contain the neurotransmitter, it would have been acetylcholine if this was a muscle cell, uh, to be released and into that gap in the synaptic cleft. Those neurotransmitters then go across the synaptic cleft and bind to their receptors on the postsynaptic neuron membrane. Those are going to be usually chemically gated ion channels. And the binding of the neurotransmitter is going to open ion channels and create graded potentials. Binding is going to cause a receptor protein to change its shape and that will open the ion channel. That causes a graded potential in the postsynaptic cell. And that potential can be excitatory, it can make it less negative around that membrane, or inhibitory, it can make it more negative around that membrane. Uh, and there are some receptor proteins that are also ion channels. So our signal has come down the axon, opened up calcium channels in the presynaptic neuron, the calcium coming into the cell caused the release of neurotransmitters to the synaptic cleft, the neurotransmitters bind to receptors on the postsynaptic neuron, and that can lead to inhibitory or excitatory graded potentials. They are limited to that particular area, though. So neurotransmitters uh, then have to be degraded, just like they did in the muscle stimulation, because uh, as long as that neurotransmitter is there, uh, graded potentials will continue. Uh, so within a few milliseconds, neurotransmitter is often terminated either by reuptake by the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron. Uh, astrocytes within the, the region might be degraded by enzymes that are in that synaptic space, or they may just diffuse away from the synaptic cleft. So the neurotransmitters are here, and we don't want them there forever, or else this would continue to signal forever. So you get rid of them by those various mechanisms. So there is a synaptic delay. As I said, this is a rate-limiting step. The time needed for a neurotransmitter to be released, diffuse across the membrane and bind to its receptor can take anywhere from 3 tenths to 5 milliseconds. Uh, the transmission of the action potential is very quick, but synapse slows the transmission so the, to the postsynaptic neuron very significantly. Uh, we don't notice it they're still very fast, but if we were measuring, it would uh, that's how we would account for it, by the synaptic delay. Electrical synapses are much less common. Uh, in electrical synapse, the neurons are electrically coupled to one another, kind of like splicing two wires together. They're joined by gaps junctions. Those gap junctions connect the cytoplasm of adjacent neurons. Communication here is very rapid can be unidirectional or it can be bidirectional. They can go in both directions. 
we find these in brain regions responsible for eye movements in the hippocampus that are involved in emotions and memory. Uh, they are more abundant in embryonic nerve tissue than they are in adult. So these are going to generate postsynaptic potentials. Postsynaptic potentials, the neurotransmitter receptors that are either are going to regulate things based on the amount of neurotransmitter and the time the neurotransmitter stays in the cleft. So depending on the effect of the chem chemical synapse, there are two types of postsynaptic potentials. An EPSP, an excitatory postsynaptic potential, or an IPSP, an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So a life of a neuron really is kind of confusing. I like this analogy uh, in the book. You've got all kinds of nerves saying fire, all kinds of nerves saying don't fire to this nerve, and this nerve has to make a decision whether to flick that switch, which really means talk to another nerve. Uh, and that integration of that information, deciding to when all those voices are talking to you, deciding what to do is how we get um, interpretation of the world. So excitatory synapses, uh, the neurotransmitters open chemically gated channels. Uh, they allow for sodium and potassium to run in opposite directions, much like we talked about earlier. Sodium influx is going to be greater than potassium efflux, so we, the uh, resulting local net graded potential can cause an excitatory postsynaptic potential. And if their ESPs trigger an action potential, what they have to reach that threshold strength. And that can spread down the axon hillock, trigger the opening of voltage-gated channels, causing the action potential to be generated and move down the axon of the postsynaptic neuron. Inhibitory ones, the binding of the receptors uh, to chemically-gated channels allows entrance or exits of other ions that cause hyperpolarization. They make the postsynaptic membrane more permeable to potassium or chlorine. So if potassium channels open, it will move out of the cell, making it more negative in the cell. If calcium channels open, uh, sorry, chlorine channels open, chlorine will move into the cell, making it more negative inside the cell. That reduces the postsynaptic neuron's ability to produce an action potential because you still have to reach the same threshold have to start from further away if it's more negative. So we get summation of these postsynaptic neurons. A single ESP doesn't induce an action potential. Enough ESPs can summate, add together to influence a postsynaptic neuron. Uh, inhibitory can do the same thing. They can add up. A single inhibitory won't uh, block it, but many can add up. So most neurons are listening to other neurons that some of them are giving them excitatory, and some of them are giving them inhibitory, uh, and most neurons are connected to thousands of other neurons. So only if the excitatories predominate and bring it to the threshold will the action potential be generated. And there are two types of summation that can do this, temporal and spatial. So in temporal summation, one or more of the synaptic neuro, presynaptic neurons transmits the impulse in rapid order. So the first impulse induces an EP, and before it can dissipate, other EPSPs are generated, adding to the first impulse. In spatial summation, the postsynaptic neuron is stimulated by a large number of terminals simultaneously, and many smaller ESPs are created, and they add together. So <clears throat> we know that Repeated use of a synapse increases the presynaptic cell to excite postsynaptic neuron, so we call this synaptic potentiation. Calcium concentrations increase in that presynaptic terminal, causing the release of more neurotransmitters. That's more EPSPs in the postsynaptic neuron. The uh, potentiation can cause calcium voltage gates to open on postsynaptic neurons, and calcium activates kinase enzymes. Remember are enzymes that put phosphates on things, turning them on and off, and that leads to more effective response and subsequent stimulation. And we know that long-term potentiation is related to learning and memory, and we think it has to do with 
this type of event. The more you use a neuro, a neural pathway, the more easy it is to use that neural pathway. Presynaptic inhibition, you release the excitatory neurotransmitter by one neuron, inhibited by another neuron through the axo axonal synapse. You get less neurotransmitter released, leading to smaller EPSPs. So before we go any further, let's uh, take a break, and then we'll come back with a new set dealing with neurotransmitters, because there are a 